saving the present company of Philip Allott. I'm still after the great delight to see him here. Martin Koskinemi is one of the most significant theorists in international law. It's more than that, I don't say he's the greatest public intellectual in the world, and I don't say he's the greatest international lawyer in the world, but he is without question the greatest international lawyer who is a public intellectual in the world. <laughs> we had him here as Goodhart Professor some years ago, and it was the result of that that the that partnership, I don't speak in too strong terms, which led to uh, the Cambridge Companion to International Law uh, developed, and th that is being launched this evening at 5.30. You're all welcome to come to that. After the end of the lecture, you are, however, unless you're invited to the conference, not welcome to stay. And I will shiver you out, because there's all sorts of logistic arrangements that have to be made. Uh, if you want to speak to Marty, there will be an opportunity to do so this evening at the launch. Uh, I should... Is Tara here? She's right in the distance. You can have the flowers, please. Well, while we're getting Tara, I'll give you the other notices that need to be given. Um, I mean, there are any other notices. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. The title of today's talk is The Politics of International Law. Marty has published a book, We Authors, Ma'am, on the Politics of International Law, published by Hart. It is available to you at a 35% discount. And we promise to sell four copies. <laughs> you, can you can alternatively use the brochure for the talk today and get a 20% discount directly from Hart, thereby missing out on the 15%. So you'd be most welcome to buy one of these things afterwards and there'll be someone available to take your cash. All right. We'll give the flowers later on. So, Marty, it's a great pleasure to have you back to speak on the politics of international law. And I won't give you flowers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be back in Cambridge again, to see so many friends, <coughs> colleagues, to see James, and the whole operation of the Lauterpart Centre uh, once again. So uh, it's customary for speakers to congratulate themselves of the difficulty of the topic uh, they've been given, or they've given themselves. It, there's two specific difficulties with this topic. On the one hand, it sort of points me to summarize everything I've done uh, in the course of my professional life. I wouldn't do that, I would be bored and we'd st be still be sitting here next year. On the other hand, there's been a conference uh, the morning on the politics of international law. So many of you are completely inside this topic, have a sophisticated framework being uh, constructed in your minds by this. And you will feel that I will just be repeating some of those uh, issues that we discussed in the morning. Um, but it is true that uh, this is also a summary of, of what I've been saying in different forms in the course of the years. The book, The Politics of International Law, is a collection of essays. Some of uh, you may know some of those essays. They all are obsessively focusing just on that one question about what does the political mean in international law? How does it operate? And how, or let me put it in this way, how does our intuitive understanding of the politics of international law get articulated in the various professional practices in which we are engaged. But I'm not going to summarize the book either. I'm just going to clear the way to, uh, have to explain to you what is the relationship finally now within these walls at this moment, uh, what is the relationship between international law and politics. And I say a few words at the, at the end uh, on where I think the politics might now be uh, going. Okay, so but the, uh, like all good things, or like, let's say like all intellectual things, this story also has to start in Germany. And it starts uh, with a juxtaposition of, of two persons, Hans Morgenthau and Herr Schlauterbach. So Hans Morgenthau, 
the founder of the inter of international relations, famously in the United States after he uh, migrated, um, published his dissertation 1929 on the tasks and limits of uh, international law. Uh, in German. There was a Frankfurt dissertation and in that dissertation he asked himself the question what is the role of law in the international political world? He's, uh, and he particularly wanted to address the question which many German lawyers including his own supervisor Karl Strupp had been asking how can we accommodate or deal with the famous reservation of vital interests and honor in international arbitrations. Is there a way to professionally deal with that? It's a political reservation, clearly. And Morgenthau said, well, it cannot be delimited or delineated in any, in any specific way. That whether we feel some a matter that uh, deals with our vital interests or honor is a function of how intensely we feel about that matter. Politics um, is an intensity field. Things be start to, we start to feel a thing being political when we feel intensely about that. And there is no way we can map out the aspects of the world about which people feel more or less intensely. Which led him to suggest in this book that there is no way to define the, the de or delimit international law and politics, that would not be a political decision. So Hans Morgenthau, for him everything in this, if, if, so here is, if here is politics, there is law. For him, law is whatever is left once the political uh, has been alienated. The, the space of law, the little bit in this universe of things here, is constantly conditioned by our <coughs> understanding of the political or, or our desires and passions, what we feel intensely. So what we are cool about and nonchalant about, that's law and it's this little thing over here is what he said. Now Herr Schlauterbach, 1933 in Britain wrote his The Function of Law in the International Community precisely to refute this view. Lauterpatz's function also starts with the query about the nature of the reservation of vital interest and honor. Can it be delimited? And he says, like uh, Morgenthau, whom, for whom he had great appreciation, you can find Lauterpatz's review of, uh, of Morgenthau's dissertation um, uh, in the British Yearbook uh, at the, in the early uh, 1930s. Um, and, um, uh, so Lauterbach looks in particular at, at three different questions. He asks the, the general, for the general question that he asks is what is the role of political in law? And he sees political intervene in three different ways. First is the vital interest and honor. He says, well, it's true that it cannot be delimited by any criterion, but we can all uh, find a place to it in our imagination. As legal professionals we have no difficulty in giving room to sovereignty. Sovereignty, of which vital interest and honor are an expression, is a legal notion. And of course there's a role for sovereignty, like there is for vital interest and honor, but that role is completely delineated by law, by legal argument, through judges, on an every, everyday basis. The second question he asked, was, well, what about the famous distinction between legal rights and political interests? People were saying at this time, if a matter deals with political interests, lawyers should not touch it, or deals with political rights. And again, Lauterbach would say, yes, there is some truth to that, but this doesn't mean that lawyers could not delineate a specific area where political interests, that is to say, sovereignty operates, that area is delimited by law. And, um, uh, and in this way can be dealt with. And the third problem he dealt with was the problem of peace. Many people were saying, not least because of the problems related to the covenant of the League of Nations and the, and the Paris Peace Treaty, that, uh, that peace is not a legal notion. And, that, and we heard this in the Yugoslavia 
situation. For example, that when it's an issue of peace, then it has to be dealt with by diplomats or by soldiers, lawyers really mix, mix these things up, make life more difficult. And Lauterbach said finally, well, this is an altogether stupid view of law. Lawyers are not that idiotic to overlook concerns of peace. If a concern of peace is real, it can always be articulated as a legal concern. So Lauterbach was making the same argument about the impossibility the impossibility through a criterion of distinguishing the legal and the political. But what he was saying was that, well, through law we can always leave a space for political decisions, for sovereignty. It's just a matter of the, the jurisdiction, a jurisdictional delimitation undertaken by law. So you see, at that early moment in the interwar era, two German trained internationalists both addressed the issue of the relations of international law and politics. Both said there can be no delimitation, but what their conclusion that they drew was exactly the opposite. Uh, uh, with Morgenthau saying politics determines whatever little role there is to law, Lauterbach saying law determines whatever little role there is to politics and sovereignty. So this leads me to, and I apologize for those students and friends who've seen this figure sufficiently often. So this leads me to now finally rid ourselves of the question and the problem, what is the relationship between law and politics? This image which it deter in the course of decades it has deteriorated very badly, I have to say. Uh, the animal isn't really very, very, very well at present. But this is of course the, the famous Wittgensteinian duck rabbit. It's uh, supposed to be a duck looking in this direction and a rabbit looking in that direction. So the, the final answer to the question of the relationship between international law and politics is that it is exactly the same as the relationship between the duck and the rabbit in this image. Now, what is that relationship? The relation, what can we say about the relationship between the two? On the one hand, we can say that the distinction is not something in this image, in the world itself, in this image itself. The distinction is something that we operate in our minds. And we, of course, some of us are better and some of us are worse in this. And when I show, and as this is going to deteriorate in the course of, of further years, if I still uh, am able to, to teach this, then it will become more and more difficult for audiences to imagine what's going on here. <laughs> but especially if they followed my career in the past, they will train themselves and they will see, they will train themselves to flip the coin and to see, well, duck, rabbit, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, and so on. And if you, if you ask small children, you will often hear that or, or, or see that they don't have that kind of flexibility. They usually say, well, it's a duck. And then you say, well, can't you see the rabbit? Can't you see the rabbit? And then slowly they get, yeah, oh, all right. And then, then they train themselves. And then they become suave operators in the international world by being able to recognize from a discourse that they hear from a distance, whether it's a lawyer or a political scientist uh, that's speaking. So it's not out there. And there is, in this sense, something quite nonsensical in asking the question about the relationship between law and politics, if it's the question between, uh, about the uh, relationship between the duck and the rabbit. But there's another important thing here. It's, of course, uh, uh, this is a, a famous uh, image of Gestalt psychology, in which uh, we look at how people um, uh, visualize things. And the point in Gestalt psychology is that we always visualize things as holes. It's about the holism of our uh, psychological lives. This means that when we see a duck or a rabbit, we see always an animal as a whole. None of us sees 
a terrible monster who was a half duck, half rabbit. The, the psychological mechanism always uh, makes the quite imperfect image whole. It makes an understanding of it. And this is also an important aspect of our professional lives. When we act as lawyers, we don't act as 75% lawyers, 25% politicians, or 50% and 50%. No, if we perform a legal task, then it's a legal task from the beginning to the end. It's, uh, it's a whole. And uh, we can compare this with two languages. So there are langu the languages of rabbits and the la languages of ducks. It might, of course, be possible to say that there is a language that's half duck, half rabbit. But this would mean that half of the populations of those animals would always end up misunderstanding or not understanding each other. When we speak a language, we speak a language as a whole. It would be idiotic for me here to start to insert Finnish uh, words in my English sentences. It might be exotic, but it would not enhance our understanding of, of what it is that I'm saying. The point is that law and politics are whole professions. They are whole forms of our existential lives. They are languages. They have their own rules. They have their own professional engagements. They have their own interests. They have their own agendas. They have their histories, their sociologies, their psychological predispositions, their ways of behavior, their cultural patterns, the kinds of jackets that people wore, the bags they carry, the books they read, the love affairs they wait. All of this comes together as a whole image of what we recognize as what it is to be a lawyer or to be um, a politician. And we can, uh, to finish with this, we can witness this in our students. And when they innocently come from schools and they all look the same. And then after maybe six months, maybe one year, we start to recognize those who actually went to the law school. And they recognize that those who went to read political science, they start to seem different. They become different. Ducks separate from rabbits. From some understandable and meaningful standpoint, they are just the same. But from, their, from the perspective of their own understanding of themselves, they become different. They, they start to speak duck and rabbit. And they disagree about it, it with uh, each other. And they have different preferences. Their politics is slightly different. And we all know how, in which ways, they are different. So this is the final word about the relationship between law and politics, and I could stop here. But as you know, I have still have 40 minutes to go, so I can't well stop here, and you've all come here. Uh, so I, I need to continue. So there is a question, a further question to be asked. Well, why would one want to imagine oneself as a duck or as a rabbit? What specific interest is there for us to be rabbits today? Everybody, why are we rabbits? So we have this imagination about what it is that rabbits do in contrast to ducks. So there is a f familiar understanding in all of us about what the world is like and what we should do about the world. That's, uh, and it's an image that's portrayed to us always in first year law classes, even at school, when we ask ourselves well, what this thing law is. So there is this narrative which says that once upon a time it was all dark and dangerous, it was a jungle out there, we fought for our lives, it uh, was a bellum omnium contra omnes, in whichever vocabulary you want to say it, it was politics. It was dark and dangerous, passionate, uncontrollable, anarchic, whatever, it was really a tough place. Law came to take us away from there. So law is, in this sense, the other of politics. Whatever it is, law is those rules, those institutions, those mentalities, those um, ways of behavior which are opposite to this. 
Well, is there more to be said about? Yes, there is more to be said about that. So, um, so there is this understanding about the relationship. So, but there, but you, you must see this is a progress narrative. So this is not just a conceptual relationship. This is also a temporal uh, tem uh, relationship between the political past and the legal future. So one way of thinking of this, well, the the danger of politics is that that it's just facts. It's power. It's the tank that came uh, into my country. It's the, the bomb that fell. It's the fist that hit my nose, etc. And so it's what happens. It's a sociological fact. Some people have power. Other people don't have power. That's one understanding of politics, power politics. And so to get away from there, we need that which is not facts. So what's that? So that's ideas. So this is the identity of law as ideas, typically as rules, also institutions, as principles. Rules such uh, uh, as uh, non-use of force, um, a pristine environment, good ideas, ideas which whatever content they have mark themselves by their contrast to the dark facts of power and present existence. So that's one way of understanding and many political scientists, realists, present this kind of an image, in part to ridicule law because of the weakness of ideas if you juxtapose them with, with tanks and fists and, and power over there. Uh, now, the, now Hans Morgenthau is on, on this side. I am a man who, who stands strong in the dark jungle that politics is, whereas you, Hirsch, Lauterpath, or we here at the Lauterpath Center, are men and women of ideas who can just be swept away by uh, whatever happens over here. So that's one understanding. Law has some non-factual aspect to it, which is, I, uh, 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 as I've put it many times, normativity. That's an aspect that, that law has. Law, to, to the facts of power, law poses the normativity of ideas. But there's another understanding of the relationship as well. And it is politics as socialism, capitalism, um, uh, neoliberalism, uh, old liberalism, law as ideologies, <laughs> law as uh, utopias in the sky, uh, sorry, politics as utopias and as political ideologies, party programs, um, and, and so on. Why? In some ways, we, the world could be ruled by ideologies. Why isn't it ruled by ideologies? Well, because we think ideologies are dangerous. Ideologies are intangible. Ideologies are merely smokescreens for the passions and selfish desires of the speakers of the languages of those ideologies. So we can't rule the world. It's un intangible. Uh, we can't rule the world through ideologies. So we need, instead, we need the police. We need facts, we need legal facts, institutions, we need um, a court system, we need uh, the fact of there being a rule book in which we can find out what the law said instead of, of consulting uh, Father Lenin about what it is, how we should live. And there are dozens of narratives that link to both of these stories. This is the story of law as wonderful humanitarian ideas that intervene in the dark jungle of power politics. This is the story of law as policemen, order, uh, institutions of society that intervene against the endless blabber of ideologues. <coughs> now, of course, this thing uh, creates a perpetuum mobile in which one of the things that can be said about it is that for every idea that the legal, that the law presents, somebody is able to say that, oh, that's only ideology, that's your humanitarian or you an ideology, it's a constitutionalist ideology. In which case, the, you fall into being just an ideologue from the perspective of, of that speaker and he or she can then 
juxtapose your ideology with uh, the facts uh, of the politics. The, so on both sides we move with uh, facts and ideas and on both sides we constantly juxtapose the, op the opponent's ideas with our facts and the opponent's facts with our ideas. This was the perpetuum mobile that uh, triggered the, or that uh, was constructed in the course of my writing of From Apology to Utopia now a, a very long time ago and that appears and reappears over and over again uh, in the various essays of this, uh, this book, uh, this more recent book on the politics of uh, international law. Now why do we still feel that law is able to trump politics? Because of the reason that we think that law enshrines ideas that are valuable against the dark facts of politics. But also because we think that law has a concreteness, a solidity about it, a verifiability. Look at all these books which are here in order to show the concreteness of the legal world in juxtaposition to the endless debates in parliaments and at political rallies. To rely on this we are on safe ground to just to go by what the politicians say, we are not, and so on. So law has this um, rhetorical power that uh, seduces us over and over again to imagine ourselves as lawyers instead of as um, politicians. <clears throat> So why do we go to law? Law is the language of rabbits as against the language of politics, the language of ducks. What, why should we want to choose one language over another? Well, this is because languages are instruments or languages are ways of life through which we come to see some things very clearly. Law enables us to see society in a particularly sharp fashion. That's useful for us. Law, law's insights tell us about society things that non-lawyers do not know. We know this from everyday experience. Lawyers in some aspects of their phenomenological lives are more capable operators of the world than other people are. So that's a plus. But it comes with a minus. There's a blindness about law too. And we see this in some of the colleagues who even at moments of friendship in the evening, we've already left our jackets, we've had a couple of drinks, and they keep on and on about these cases they've read and about the new legislation, etc. The inability to look at life from without the legal spectacles on. That's a huge human problem often, but it's also, I suggest, a big social problem. We don't want lawyers to rule the world, not because we wouldn't think lawyers would be good, as good as any others, but they are, after all, lawyers. They are the people who find a problem for every solution. We don't want them, we don't need other kinds of people. So the legal vocabulary enables us to operate, but it also makes us hopeless uh, operators in situations where we should just live. Now, but we are also called upon to be lawyers, with, to become rabbits instead of ducks, because it offers us a profession. And a profession empowers us. To be a legal professional is or goes together with a number of things that we want to have. The paycheck is usually, well it could be better but it's okay. The places we travel, the conferences we go to, the way in which people listen to what is, how we speak in moments when the lawyer speaks. We enjoy that. So it empowers us. So that's the plus. Now what's the minus? Well, it makes us irresponsible. 
So it enables us to say, oh, it's not me who decides, it's, you know, the decision comes from this book and off you go, 30 years or to life, or whatever it is we say. Uh, so it's not we, it's the law. That kind of uh, an attitude in some social circumstances is precisely what we want to inculcate. But, and the German history would be just one example, it would not be the only mindset that we would want to inculcate. The legal mindset is a mindset of personal irresponsibility. So, again, a plus and a minus. Thirdly, to become a rabbit is to choose a set of projects. Law, in addition to being a vocabulary, and a profession is also historically situated in the advancement of some projects. The lawyers' preferences are not the common citizens' preferences. Law comes with a definite normative baggage. In the international world, we can all mostly pick out very rapidly five, six, seven kinds of preferences. It's a constitutionalization project, it's an institutionalization project, it's a project for uh, empowerment of particular kinds, there are bureaucratic practices that are being advanced of, say, uh, of certain types, there is an automization of social collectivities of a particular kind, and so on. Law is instrumental towards these kinds of projects. My own historical research now looks at how the idea of an individual right um, emerged, uh, spread, and was attached to various kinds of social problems, to various projects of um, exercise of power in the world. It's instrumental, but it's also limiting, and many of us, especially in, the, in human rights classes, when we lecture uh, students on David Kennedy's writings, we lecture to them about the various ways in which the legal language limits our ability to operate and help out uh, those whom we want to help. It's instrumentally useful, but it's not a panacea. There's a final question about this aspect of law, the goods that law brings. It's a philosophical question, it's a question that is often raised in Europe, seldom elsewhere than in Europe, or at least, well, it's raised because the uh, Europeans think they have some response to this, and this concerns the inner value of law. That there is some morality that automatically uh, is attached to rabbits, but that ducks lack. I'm agnostic about this. I think it's for all rabbits, it's extremely important to imagine that they, as a, alongside being rabbits, are also moral animals. That they, uh, that they read books, educate each other in moral vocabularies, and imagine that the ducks very business in the various ponds in which they exercise duck kind of authority. I, I realize I'm mixing now ducks and rabbits, which actually is a mistake, it's a terrible mistake that one should never do. Um, but you get the point. Uh, so, there is, I think, a value to it that lawyers think of their profession as having a morally articulable core uh, or aspect. Uh, to it. Now, but I do have something more to say about the legal project, and I have to, and this something more has to do with the why it is that I find it so difficult to think that rabbits, no, so it's rabbits, it's lawyers, so that rabbits are actually engaged in a moral project, and that has to do with the narratives that rabbits tell about what the kind nature of the project is. And I already earlier pointed out that it's, there's a chronology about it, that it's a, it's a progress narrative in which there, uh, there is a starting point which is an experience 
and then there is an objective uh, somewhere there. The, we wouldn't, so uh, as the saying goes, in a, in, a, in a world of angels no law would be needed. We need law because we somehow feel that the present world is insufficient as it is, unacceptable in some aspects of it. And of course we widely differ in our sense of how intensely we feel that the world is unacceptable or disastrous or slightly problematic, however we want to put that. Anyway, we need law in order to get us away from that experience, the negative experience, to some sort of a goal that's out there. Now, that's fine, that's an aspect of law. It's also an aspect of, uh, of the fact that rabbits do think of themselves as moral animals. Where uh, would they not be inculcated in this kind of a progress story? They would find it harder to think of themselves as acceptable as they come uh, from with the paycheck back home uh, at the end of the month. But the experience that they have of the, the unacceptability of the world is problematic. Many people would say that the experience, this is a standard international law point, that the experience of unacceptability can be enshrined in sovereignty. Sover sovereign. Sovereignty. Herr Schlauterbach was typically one of these people. Many human rights, environmental activists, many people in the cause of fight against impunity feel that sovereignty is the problem. Sovereignty they feel is a problem because it's a kind of egoism. It's a way of turning inside, it's a way of keeping the world outside. It's just being obsessed about me and my power and my values and my preferences. Uh, however, uh, whatever their uh, nature. And if that is the negative experience, then of course the experience itself suggests what the project should be. The project should be community, international community. Uh, so we all, we are all familiar with that kind of an understanding of the world. So here it is, we as lawyers are in the business of turning an unacceptable world of sovereign egoists into a wonderful world of communitarian sitting by the campfire and singing we shall overcome every evening. Um, and if it were like that, if that were the way people felt about the world, then rabbits would be fine. And, and all they would need to do was uh, to get out there to the pond and transform the damn egoistic small communities into a big community of the forest, for example. But that's, so not everybody feels this as the problem. As a matter of fact, many people feel that something they would might call, for instance, empire is the problem. And this might be empire felt in many different ways. It would be the empire of, let's say, neoliberalism, or American empire, or empire of capitalism, empire of a suffocating ideology of some kind, a totalitarian thing, some aspect of the world that doesn't allow us to express our identity, our identity as sm in, in small groups, or our identity as individuals. It's an experience that we are being not allowed to express ourselves. We suffocate inside this homogenizing world. And from this we of course, the, and this analysis of the situation, this malaise immediately suggests another uh, project which is the project of autonomy. Now here it is, the international law lawyers uh, that we are feel the world in terms of two different kinds of experience. On the one hand the experience of untrammeled egoism. They do just what they want. There. We need to build a community. We need to tie us and take hands with each other. That's what we want to have. On the other hand, there are those people who say, well, there's too much taking of hands here, damn it. I want to take 
to control of my own hands, of my life, of, of everything that's special about me. Now, of course, these are both part of the problem and part of the solution. The experience that we as human beings have of the world isn't homogeneous. It is different. We feel the world's weight in different ways. We feel the weight of the world as alienated individuals bumping into each other like ships in the night, only obsessed about themselves. Or we feel the world as this um, religious sect into which we are all compelled to, in which we are all compelled to sing, sing the same hymns, to think the same thoughts, to dress the same way, etc. And those opposite experiences give us two opposite uh, projects. Now, however, again, these opposite projects aren't transparent. It's not obvious what autonomy and community mean in their positive descriptions to those who aren't involved in the describing business itself. So every autonomy, every call for autonomy is a call for sovereignty. My personal sovereignty, the sovereignty of my tribe, the sovereignty of my country, etc. In which case it starts to feel terribly egoistic and um, a part of the problem. Every community will sooner or later start to feel suffocating. We feel the imperial weight descending upon us. Yesterday it was all fun, but we can't keep on singing this song no, no, day in, day out. There have to be other songs and other ways of life. And so it, the game starts all over the, again. Now, the international law, or being a rabbit, is a wonderful experience to the extent that it allows us to think of a moment that's outside our present existence. To think of ourselves as involved in a real effort, perhaps a collective effort, in which the negative experiences of the present would be transcended in a future that's bright and shiny and into which our institutions are taking us. The problem with that is that we feel, as I said, the world's weight differently. And not only differently, but in opposite ways. In ways that enable us collectively, but perhaps more interestingly, individually, to both want and not want what we intuitively first uh, would like to have as our uh, world-changing project. So the awareness of this, awareness of the ambivalence <coughs> of the world and of myself, of every rabbit, has made it for me impossible to think that there actually is in some way an internal morality to being a rabbit that would make being a rabbit somehow in some evaluative scale more important, meaningful than being a duck. There are, I've said, moments like for instance when you want to run away from somebody that you want to be a rabbit rather than a duck and then it's Good fortune if you happen to have that education and those ears and you were able to go that fast. But it's not always like that. And if there's a pond and you have to cross, then you know what you have to do. For best of my students, I, I recommend that they are prepared to be both one and the other. That they can flip the coin, that they can immediately see uh, the, bo both sides of, of those professional alternatives that are being offered uh, to them. There is one final thing. I promised to say something about the politics of uh, international law today. So, I want to uh, set up a use Kogan's prohibition to those of my left friends who, in the course of the years, 
together with me, have insisted on the politicization of this or that. We know it's a regular left theme to look at the politics of international law, of economics, to say it's political. Now, having, having said that often enough, and having gone through these images often enough, it has, I can report to you, come to transpire that that evocation of the political is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. If you catch me still do doing this in the future, yeah, uh, well, I'll give you 50 euros, uh, to put it no higher than that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so I want to invoke a prohibition of ever to, uh, to look at the politicization of this. Because it's the, to call for the politicization of this or that would be to insist on it being a duck or a rabbit. But there are questions of authority, of importance out there. Questions of um, preference, questions of distribution, questions of good and less good choices. How do we go about them? So one uh, prevalent phenomenon in my professional life uh, has been the fragmentation of international law. And, and well, I don't want to go into this in any detail, but I've come to understand fragmentation as a professional worry among ambitious uh, operators that the legal vocabulary, that speaking rabbit, no longer carries the kind of authority that it used to. And therefore, we have to speak um, trade law, economic law, security law, human rights law, environmental law, um, sports law, uh, you have it. Now that uh, development has been conventionally discussed in terms of the politics of expertise. We become more and more technical in our expertise, in our demand of expertise, in our recognition of what is authoritative in the languages that parade in the international political field. Now it seems to me that the relationship between law and politics is not the only relational thing in the world that can be articulated in terms of an analysis like this. What is environmental law? What is the law of the sea? What is um, chemical law, for example? In the course of the fragmentation project, project, I look at some examples and I found that, for instance, if one imagines a, a carriage of, uh, of chemical substances in, let, to take an almost random example, in the Baltic Sea, one can articulate that in legal terms in nine different languages, nine different, if you wish, rule schemes, nine different professional sensibilities, nine different frames, law of the sea, human rights, chemical law, Baltic law, the law of the laws of the coastal states, etc., etc., etc. And each of these articulations carried with it a slightly different suggestion as to how one should deal with that problem. I suggest to you that this problem is endemic and that everywhere, every aspect of our contemporary lives can be recounted in easily half a dozen, a dozen, doesn't really matter uh, how many expert languages. And each of those languages comes with its own cultural, sociological, historical, and of course, economic biases. The task for active left-leaning, why not also not so left-leaning lawyers, to trying to operate in this world in a fashion that would be politically effective, would today, it seems to me, call for what I've called the politics of redescription. Politics of redescription would be about 
looking at a problem out there in the world and describing, or in this case, redescribing the problem in terms of the language of which we, me and my friends, feel that we are authoritative. And then to deal with that problem in the way we want to deal with this. The politics of redescription is made all the easier because those who uh, are responsible for the fragmentation, for the rise of the rule of technical languages, are usually committed to believing that each language is an ontolo or addresses an ontological aspect of the world, that each language is the authentic representative of what it is that it purports to represent. If there is one thing that rabbits learn in rabbit school, it is that there are no such languages. And that rabbits are, that the special professional ability of rabbits is to jump from one, lang one language to another, to be natives, uh, native language speakers in as many languages as they have political projects. Uh, and I end with that ambiguous note. Thank you. <laughs>